Okay, it's a great pleasure uh, welcoming Leo Burstein. Leo Burstein spent the last couple of days with us in a workshop uh, on behavioral economics. So my question to you is, why are you here tonight? Uh, I guess there are many reasons to be here tonight, but uh, one may be that you're interested in behavioral economics, and the other is that you want to learn how this field contributes to make people move, basically. And believe me, um, Leonardo is really an expert in behavioral economics, but he's also an expert in getting things moved. And being an expert in these fields is really challenging because it requires to know what people, uh, what makes people move. And uh, before I go to the details of uh, Leo's research, maybe I give you some, some facts about his vita. So he's a uh, Brazilian. Uh, he studied economics, both the bachelor and the master's in Brasilia, before he moved to Harvard. And then he worked as an assistant professor at UCLA, Los Angeles. Uh, and now he's, uh, so basically moved to University of Chicago, where he still is. And uh, he has been promoted a full professor only recently. And um, he's only 37 years old. So this makes him the youngest professor in Chicago, at least in the economics department. This is what I have learned today. OK, so uh, what is Leo's work about? Uh, one of his first papers was on the impact of uh, Western television in the former GDR. So after the breakdown of the German uh, wall, uh, he studied consumption behavior um, of people being exposed to German television. Now, this sounds like marketing. But Leo's interest is not so much uh, studying marketing, so he really wants to understand why people change their behavior. So his uh, big special speciality is social norms, social image, social image concerns. So to which extent do we care what other people, what other people think about us? And he has a, a number of papers pointing out that social norms act as a constraint on people's behavior. And he has famous studies on this issue. So one is, uh, in the recent vote in the US, where Trump actually uh, won the election, what he observed is that uh, uh, after Trump's popularity was going up, it increased the willingness of people to express xenophobic views. So there's one thing to believe this story, but there's another thing to really prove this story. So Leo was able to prove that high electoral support for a candidate who espouses prejudiced views may shape how individuals perceive the social desirability of those views. Uh, there's another famous study that made it a lot into the media and uh, was discussed uh, heavily in the, in the, in the media, uh, is labeled acting wife. Uh, so what does that mean? So students were asked about their desired compensation, hours of work, and days per month of travel. And this questionnaire actually had substantial stakes because uh, depending on the answer of this uh, questionnaire, uh, you would have been assigned to a student internship. So there were substantial stakes to these answers. Now, this, the finding was really surprising. So when women expected that their classmates would see their answers, they have portrayed themselves as much less favorable to the labor market. And the interesting phenomenon was that this applied only for single women. So basically, uh, you're living on the expectations, uh, you're acting on expectations of others, and it has a strong impact on, on labor market-related outcomes. Now, Leo's research is in, impressively brass. So, so next to behavioral economics, you have been working on macroeconomic growth models. So endogenous growth models showing that the technological change can be directed towards environmentally sustainable growth, for instance. One of the most cited papers of yours is on this aspect. Uh, you worked on peer effects in financial decision making. Uh, so basically, whenever you buy uh, an asset, there may be two reasons for that. One reason is that, uh, so you observe somebody buying an asset and you want to buy the same asset. And the one reason could be, well, there's some informational value seeing somebody else buying the asset. Or there may be just uh, learning from others' choices, like social utility. So you had a very clever design to separate between these two uh, different stories. Uh, what I want to point out is that uh, Leo's research is highly accessible. 
So he has extremely clever designs, very clean and intuitive designs, with very, very strong results. So I'm coming back to the achievements again. So I've counted like 17 papers by now. We call that papers. Uh, many of those are published, and most, I mean, almost all of them are published in the top outlets in economics. Again, this is an indication that uh, you have the quality of having these very clean designs uh, conveying a very strict message uh, with a lot of compelling evidence. So Leo, it's a great pleasure having you, and please join me welcoming Leo Burstein. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me today and, and for being here. I think it's a little loud. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the very kind words, Rupert. Um, uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, understanding peer pressure uh, in education from evidence to policy. Okay? So as Rupert was saying, um, a lot of my work recently has been about understanding to what extent our choices, our decisions we make, uh, are shaped by our concerns uh, about how people are going to judge us. You know, we live in society, around other people, and many decisions we make in life are decisions that we make in social environments. Um, you know, in schools, kids are deciding how much to study, for example, and you know, how much effort to put in, into their homework, participation in class, around their classmates. Uh, many decisions uh, in the labor market are also made in social environments, in the workplace, for example, or as, you know, for example, if you're investing in a financial asset, uh, there's something you might want to talk about to your friends. Uh, your consumption choices or things are visible to others, so that might shape, you know, what you're going to buy, if you, if you care about what people are going to think of you, if you have a cheap car versus an expensive car. So you can see how potentially a lot of our choices by me, by, might be shaped about, you know, this concern that we have, how are, gonna people, how are people going to judge me, you know, when they observe my choices? So we might have this innate desire to fit in, to, you know, to impress other people. And so how does that shape the way we behave in society? So today I'm going to be talking about a specific setting where I study this issue, which is a education. Okay? In particular, we're going to be looking at uh, high school students in the U.S. So yes, I'm going to invite you to relive those glorious days of adolescence in school and so on. Maybe it's not going to be pleasant for everyone, uh, but we're going to be talking about th this period in life. So understanding peer pressure in education from evidence to policy. So I'm going to describe a couple of papers that I've worked on, a couple of research projects that I've, I've done on the topic uh, that were experimental papers, uh, mostly. And I'll walk you through the, the, the logic of these experiments and how we can go from an abstract idea to running an experiment to providing evidence to getting insights in terms of policy design. So we're going to try to work through this process during this talk. OK? So uh, let's motivate. Um, you know, there's this long-standing idea in social sciences that uh, students, you know, if you think, for example, high school students, adolescents, uh, may moti be motivated not only by the prospects of the future benefits of education. You know, typically when economists think about education investments, they think, well, kids, you know, make investments thinking about the returns to education, how much more earnings that they're going to get if, if they invest in education. But there's this idea that there might be other things that kids might be taking uh, into consideration when deciding, you know, whether to participate in class, whether, you know, whether to uh, do well in school and, and so on, what career to choose, which is a desire to gain social approval or avoid social sanctions. Okay, so that's, that's a long-standing idea that has been floating out there. Uh, there's some classy work in sociology uh, highlighting this, this aspect. Um, you know, approval and sanctions can take many forms. Uh, maybe you want to be popular, you want to fit in, uh, or you may want to avoid being teased, being made fun of, called names, being bullied, ostracized. You know, you can, you can either gain social favor or try to avoid social sanctions. It can take several forms and limit even, you know, uh, violence or bullying and so on. Um, in the U.S., there's an idea that gained a lot of traction uh, in the last decade, which is this so-called acting white hypothesis. So some authors have put forth the idea that this, uh, there might be a, a, a particularly strong culture among, among ethnic minorities in the U.S. Uh, that is against uh, achievement, academic achievement, 
because it's considered acting white. So there's this, this you, you know, if you Google, if you look into this, there's a, a lot of work emphasizing that perhaps among uh, low-income minorities in the US, there's a culture that is against achievement, okay? Uh, so there's, you know, uh, all this, you know, discussion and so on uh, uh, that ex exists out there, potentially about the negative effects of peer pressure uh, that could actually move kids away from from making uh, education investments or exerting effort that otherwise they would, they would do in the absence of this negative culture, negative peer pressure. Uh, so at the end of the day, a student might be making an educational effort or, or decision, uh, and that student might face a trade-off, you know, in the sense that, well, if I work hard in school, that's gonna help me in the future. I'm gonna get returns to education, I'm gonna get a better job, I go to a better school, better college, and so on but I might pay a cost in the present. You know, maybe someone is gonna tease me, make fun of me, I'm not gonna be very popular, I'm gonna be considered a nerd and so on. So there's this trade-off. If I work hard in school, I'm gonna do better in the future, but I might have to pay a social cost in the present. It's kind of the idea, okay? Um, so when effort or invest, of course, this, this aspect is something about the observability of effort, okay? Uh, turns out that many things you do in school are observable by others. If you raise your hand to answer a question, your classmates are going to notice. If you answer it well, they're going to think something about you. So when effort or investment is observable to peers, students may act to avoid social penalties or gain social favor by conforming to prevailing norms in their peer group. Okay? If there's a norm that working hard in school is uncool, it's not a cool thing to do, you might you know, try to avoid it. In, in, in the goal, you know, in the hopes of, of fitting in with your peer group. So the question we're gonna be asking in this first paper is really trying to identify, do these things really exist? Do they really matter? Do they matter for important decisions? Uh, are students willing to deviate from what they privately believe to be the optimal the, uh, 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 scholastic effort or investment just because of such social concerns? Just because of a concern about how they're gonna be judged by their peers are these students willing to sacrifice, you know, decisions that otherwise they would have, you know, things they would have taken if, if in the absence of these concerns? So that's kind of the basic idea of the first study I'm going to describe today. Okay, really identifying this, 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 this peer pressure effects. So the outline today, just so we have a roadmap uh, for the, the talk. First, I'm going to be talking about how to identify this peer pressure effects in education. So I'm going to describe some work we did, really just to kind of a proof of concept, you know. Is this something that really matters in, in, a, in a setting that we might think is relevant, okay? So that's the first thing we're gonna do. After kind of proving that this thing is important, the next step is like understanding why it's happening, okay? Well, it might not be enough to say that kids are moving away from opportunities just because they're worried about how they're gonna be judged. I think it's important to know why. And I'll describe to you, I'll motivate, why we care about the why, okay? Uh, and that's gonna be the second uh, project that I'm gonna describe today. Now, after identifying these effects and understand, and providing some evidence on the mechanisms, on the channels through which they operate, uh, we're gonna be able to talk about policy, okay? And as, I, as I'll argue, and as you'll see, uh, it's important to understand, really provide clean evidence of mechanisms that we're studying, not only provide clean evidence of, of, of a phenomenon, but also understand what's driving the phenomenon. Because the mechanics, the, the reasons behind a phenomenon can really illustrate and, and guide you in your policy design decisions. And not fully understanding what's driving specific phenomenon can actually lead you to incorrect policy uh, prescriptions. Okay, so we'll, we'll discuss that uh, today, right? So from evidence to policy. So starting from identification of, of, of this uh, peer pressure effects. So this is based on a paper that was published a few years ago in the Quarterly Journal of Economics uh, with uh, Rob, Robert Jensen, who's now a professor at Yale. Uh, this is called, How Does Peer Pressure Affect Education Investment? So I'll describe to you the study we did here. So first, let me tell you some words about the setting we're studying. So this is an you know, the main part of the paper is an experiment that we ran uh, in Los Angeles. So this was a partnership with the LA Unified School District. So this is one of the largest school districts, school systems in the US <coughs> with about 700,000 students, okay? This is a public school system in Los Angeles. 
with over 150 high schools. This is also a, a district with relatively low academic performance, okay? Uh, dropout rates in high school are in the order of 25%, okay? Uh, this is also one of the so-called majority minority districts, meaning that the majority of the students in the public school system uh, come from actually ethnic minorities, okay? About two thirds of to three quarters of the uh, students in this the LA school system are actually of Hispanic Latino origin, okay, for example. So whites are actually uh, uh, a minority, about 10%. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of the setting that we're studying. Uh, now, okay, so we start from the setting and then we decided to, you know, run an experiment. Uh, so we focus on four large high schools in, in LA and we focus in a disadvantaged area of LA. So after, you know, when you run an experiment like that, a lot of it depends on, you know, striking the partnership with the stakeholder, you know, the, the, the school system <coughs> in this case, and finding the, you know, um, the right schools to run it. So we ran this experiment in four very large high schools in a low-income area of LA, uh, in the south, south central LA area. Each school had about 3,000 students. This is our large schools. We visited each school once, uh, this few years ago, 2013 and 2014 visited uh, a number of, of, of classrooms, just to give you some number, 26 classrooms. Uh, um, and interestingly, in the US, you have a system where there's some sort of tracking in high schools. You have owners and non-owners versions of the same subjects. So the more academically oriented students, on average, take the owners version of, 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 uh, of the subject and you know the other students who take the non-owners version. So that's, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but that's kind of how, how things are designed in the US. So we decided to visit both owners and non-owners classroom classes, just you know, trying to understand whether you know, there could be, be potentially different cultures in the same school. Maybe you, if you have uh, you know, a lot of students who are more academically oriented sitting together, does that generate a different culture, you know, a different peer culture in, in, in the classroom, uh, even within the same school? And as you will see, the experiment is an experiment associated with preparation for the SAT. What is the SAT? Well, the SAT is the college entrance exam in the US. So before going to college, you have to take the SAT. Or in some areas, people take the ACT, which is a similar exam. So you know, those are 11th graders, so meaning they had one more year of high school after this. And in the US, when you're, in when you're in 11th grade, that's when you're like getting ready, preparing yourself for the SAT. So it's a really, if you wanna to go to college, that's kind of a big deal, okay? Uh, so we had a, a, an experiment with a little over 800 students. Okay, so what did we do in the experiment? Of course, our goal here is to understand to what extent peer pressure shapes an important decision. Well, first thing we need is the important decision in consideration, running experiment. We have to see how a decision is shaped by the, these peer pressure concerns. So the decision that we created in the experiment was the following. We teamed up with a large uh, company that uh, manufactures uh, SAT preparation course. It's an online course that this company uh, offers. Typically, this, this is something that costs around $200 per student, you know, uh, and it's actually not sold directly to students is usually sold to schools in bulk. So schools buy a number of licenses from this company and then assign to students. So basically we had to convince this, this you know, when I did this I was starting my career, I didn't have any money to actually pay for this thing, so I had to convince the company to let us give it away for free to a number of students, you know, with the goal of furthering knowledge and things of the sort. Luckily, they, they were very open to the idea. Uh, I'll tell you why, another reason why they ended up being open in, in a sec, okay? Uh, but you know, that's kind of the idea. So we offered, so we came to these, these schools with our, our surveyors, uh, and you know, basically they were offered the chance to sign up for this SAT prep course free of charge. So it's just some nice thing we're offering them. You remember, those are low income students who otherwise would not have access to this type of service. So it is a nice opportunity that is being offered to them. What is being offered to them, well, this SAT prep course involved a number of things. I don't need to list them, they're written here. But you know, practice exam, uh, pre-recorded videos, instructional content, there's online classes, a lot of things are, that are being offered to them. Uh, and as I said, we knew that the, this company was not so selling this to these schools, so these students did not have access to it. 
OK? Um, OK, so uh, all right, so now we have the decision. So we, we want to see how something is going to affect this decision. But what is the something that we want to manipulate? What is the experiment, actually, right? So um, we wanted to, as I said, our goal here is to identify the effect of peer pressure. To what extent are kids changing their behavior, moving away from something that otherwise they would like to do because of these concerns, right, about how they're going to be judged? Okay, so in practice, what, how we did this is that uh, we, you know, so we will come to these classrooms and hand out the form to other students. And the student, the form started with, you know, some brief, you know, there was an introduction where we say, oh, we describe that we, there's, there's the company that is visiting them and there's going to be some research project, but we don't make any mention, of course, to SAT or college of peer pressure. We don't want to prime this, the, the student to think about this. Uh, and students were asked to fill out a form. And in this form that we handed out, there were a couple, you know, just their name, their, their gender identity, their uh, favorite subject, just some questions to, you know. And then after that, there was a little, there's a box in the, in the form uh, with an offer, this uh, uh, SAT prep offer. And the company name, which I'm not supposed to say, is offering a free online test preparation course for the SAT that is intended to improve your chances of being accepted and receiving financial aid at a college you like. This is the description, right? Uh, and then comes our experiment. Our experiment is very subtle. We varied one word. That's it. The, you know, we have uh, different forms that were handed out, and we handed out in alternated fashion. So you get one, you get a different one, and so on. So each student got a different, you know, every other student got a different form. And some students were told, uh, your decision to sign up for the course will be kept completely private from everyone, including the other students in the room. So basically, some students were offered privacy assurance vis-a-vis -vis their, their classmates. No one's going to, your classmates are not going to find out what you do, okay? Whereas some other students were not promised privacy with respect to their classmates. Your decision to sign up for the course will be kept completely private from everyone except the other students in the room. That's it. Just one word. To what extent they were certain that their classmates would not find out if they took this course, right? Uh, that's it. That's our experiment. The, the forms using the word including are considered the private treatment because the students wouldn't find out, the other classmates, and the forms using the word except are the public treatment. That's the experiment. Nothing fancy, very simple, okay? Uh, let's start showing some results and I'm gonna develop the analysis and show more and more stuff. But just, you know, so basically here, this, is, this graph is very simple. Basically, I'm putting here, this is the share of students who say yes to the offer, okay? Uh, out of, so 72% out of 100, okay? Uh, that's the, the share of students. In, those who get the private decision, meaning they are told that the classmates are not going to find out, and those who get the public decision. And this is non-honors classes. Remember, the, the, the regular classes, this regular version of math, English, and so on, and this is honors classes, the more academically oriented students. Here's just the first set of results. So what we see is that 72% uh, of students uh, in non-honors classes in private accept the, the offer. Okay, so most of them you know, 72%, think, well, this, this is probably a good thing. I'll say yes to this. Now, when, uh, when they believe that their classmates are going to find out, you see this drop to 61%. So 11% of the students here, because it's randomized, right, uh, uh, are saying no to this just because uh, they think their classmates are going to find out. So, you know, you come to a low-income setting, you offer them something that they don't have access to that costs $200, that'll help them get into college. There's evidence that this thing helps them. And 11% of them say no just because they don't want the classmates to find out. Okay, it's kind of the first finding. Now, interestingly, when you look at the honors classes, you already start seeing something different. First, 92% of them sign up in private, which is what we did in 72. Makes sense. Those are more academically oriented students. They're more likely to actually want to go to college and so on. So they're more likely to say yes to it. But already, there's something interesting here. You don't see this going down, okay? Whether it's private or public, you have a similarly high take-up rate, which already sort of gives us some indication that, well, maybe there are different coexisting social norms within the same school, potentially, right? So that's kind of building up our, our, our intuition here. 
It's the first set of findings. Uh, of course, um, if I stop the paper here, it would be somewhat convincing evidence that these peer pressure effects are important, but not completely convincing, and I'll tell you why. Well, just because uh, the, the decision is, the take-up rate is lower in public versus private, doesn't mean that the reason why they're uh, avoiding it is because of the concerns about how they're gonna be judged. Maybe some kids feel weird when things are public. You know, they just like privacy, they say, ah, this thing is public, I'm just gonna say no to it, right? Maybe it has nothing to do with peer pressure, but it could be just something about a strong preference for private things or aversion to public things. Could be that in principle. Oh, but then you would say, well, but why do you see, don't you see this for the honor students? I'll say, well, maybe honor students are different from the non-honor students, and maybe non-honor students care a lot about privacy, uh, and honor students don't care a lot about privacy. Who knows? You know, so we can't really say, conclude like, with confidence that it's about peer pressure. So how do we do this? What would be the, the, the cleanest experiment? The cleanest experiment would be take the same kid, okay? And you either put this kid around a bunch of nerds or you put the same kid around a bunch of non-nerds, right? And you see how the same kid changes his or her behavior in public depending on whether his surroundings is a bunch of nerds or a bunch of non-nerds. If our story is right, the same kid, when it's, he is, or she is surrounded by no nerds, will feel bad to take this in public and be less likely to do it, and perhaps feel pressure to do it in public and be more likely to do it when around, around uh, nerds. Now, that's the ideal experiment. But I don't have the power to just, you know, engineer allocation of students in classrooms and say, okay, you sit with the nerds, you sit with the non-nerds, and so on, and, and, and run that experiment, okay? So, how did we approximate this ideal experiment? Well, our idea was the following. We found that, uh, you know, learned that in the US, a number of students, so if, you want, if you're a student, you can actually choose which class you take, non-owners or owners. It's up to you. You know, no one's gonna turn you down, no one's gonna force you, it's up to the student. So, a number of students take all their classes as owners classes, and a number of students take all this, their classes as non-owners classes, but there's still a number of students, a decent share of the students, who kind of split between the two. Take some honors classes here and there and some non-honors classes, okay? So we visited these schools in a number of different days and, and we happened to catch a number of students who were some of these uh, students who take honors classes sometimes and non-honors classes sometimes. And given that we visit the schools at arbitrary times, whether we, cat, we caught one of these students when they're sitting with the honors classes or with non-owners classes it was close to random. It was ar pretty arbitrary, okay? So we said, okay, let's zoom in and look at those students who take, say, two owners classes in total and see how their behavior changed in public depending on whether we happened to catch that day, that student that day, when he was sitting next to a lot of non-owners students or when she was, she was sitting around a lot of non-owners students, depending on the class. Does that student behave differently? Uh, in public, depending on their peers, so that we're kind of holding the student characteristic fixed. We're looking at the same type of student who sits sometimes with honors classes or non-honors classes, and seeing how being around honors students or non-honors students changes the way they behave in public. Okay, that's kind of the idea. Uh, so, um, as, as, as you can see, uh, the students who take a couple of honors classes, say two honors classes, their classmates in the non-owners classes have an average GPA of 2.12, and their classmates in the owners classes have an average GPA of 3.29. And they're kind of in between. So depending, we look at different metrics, measures of academic success, and those kids are really in between their, their peers in the owners classes who are really academically oriented, and their peers in non-owners non classes who are less academically oriented than they are. So we thought, well, if that's true, if our story is true, and, and you know, and peer pressure pushes them toward the locally prevailing norm, you would expect the sign-up rate to be lower in public when they're sitting next to the non-owner students in the non-owner's classes, or higher in public when they're sitting around the owner students. So we're trying to get at this experiment, that uh, perfect experiment. Here's what we find. So those are the same types of students, students who take two honors classes in total, and this is 
what happened if they were if we visited them during a non-honors class or if you visit the same type of student when they're sitting in an honors class. And I think the results were striking. In private, this type of student was 79% of them say yes to the offer, okay? When they thought it was gonna be public and they were sitting in non-honors classes, that dropped to 54%. We're talking about a 25% reduction, 25% point reduction in the take-up rate. So a lot of kids are just turning down because they're around the non-nerds, right? And they, they might not want to be seen as nerds uh, uh, around the, those other kids. Now, the same types of kids, when they're sitting in honors classes, their private tech up rate is not very different, it's 72%. So it's not like, oh, when I'm sitting around nerds, I feel different, I feel like a nerd, I feel like empowered, I'm just gonna do, no, it's very similar in private, uh, not higher than here. But in public, you see it goes to 97%. So they feel immense pressure to actually take this up in public because now they're around the, the hardworking kids, the high achievers and so on. So the same type of kid, depending on whether they're sitting around academically oriented students or non-academically oriented students, can behave in drastically different ways. In other words, uh, depending if this is just a public action, the same student will go from 54% to 97%. It's a huge change in behavior just driven by observability, okay? So that's, you know, I think it's kind of a striking result because in private you see no difference, but in public you see this huge difference arising from, uh, from this decision. Uh, another thing that we do is that we, you know, just to provide more evidence of what we're studying, we see that the students who respond most strongly to this threat of making things public are the students who report to care more about their popularity. So there was a second form that was handed out to the students after we collect the first form, and one of the questions, from one to five, how important you think it is to be popular in your school? Kids who care more about popularity are kids who change their behavior the most in public. It's kind of a kind of sanity check. If our story is right, that would make sense, and that's what we find, okay? So that's kind of the first set of findings. Okay, so this, we ran an experiment. Okay, that's nice, there's an experiment, it's clean, but you know, one could say, uh, how valid, how universal is this? Maybe you find four schools, you found four schools for which this is true. In LA, how general are our results? You know, what can we say, how, what happens in the natural setting and so on? So, you know, it would be nice to say something more. So what we did is that from the same company, uh, and that's how actually we, we got them uh, interested in working with us. The first thing they gave us was some data from some past things they had done, you know, some past intervention. So what happens when good performance is in practice observable to peers? So basically this uh, company had introduced in 2011, if I remember well, uh, a computer-based high school remedial program uh, in over 100 schools with over 5,000 students. So those are like remedial students, students who are at risk of not graduating. And this is a program who was designed to help them uh, pass the statewide high school exit examination. So if you want to graduate, it's mostly in California, if you want to graduate, you need to pass this uh, high school exit exam. Uh, and some kids had failed it or once, or at risk of failing again, or, uh, and so this company was providing this computer-based program. So they will come to the classroom, and it's math and English, and they will do it. There was an instructor, they will do quizzes and exams and so on. What the company did is that one day, after six weeks after the school year started, they introduced a point system and a leaderboard. Basically, every question you got right when you're practicing doing your quizzes, you get some points. And uh, they created the leaderboard that was updated in real time, right? So uh, you would, there was a, I don't have the image here, but you know, there was a thing you could click here and it would tell you like the name of the best student in the class, the second best and the third best, you could do it this week, uh, last month of all time. You could also aggregate it at the school level, at the nation, na nation level. So the idea is that, oh, let's create a leaderboard, like a, a nerd leaderboard, uh, to motivate students. After all, who wouldn't want to show up in such leaderboard? That was their idea, right? Uh, oh, based on the, what our experiment told us, and if you think about you know, a low-income setting where you know, there might be a culture against achievement, uh, that might not be a great idea, right? Interestingly, this company had been doing this 
since 2010 or 2011, so a few years, and never analyzed the data. And they're convinced it was a great idea. Uh, oh, all the feedback we got from the, the schools is being very positive, we're very excited about this, we keep doing it, so on. I said, give me the data, let me look at the data. Uh, what we found is that, uh, uh, show you the pictures, once you introduce the system, immediately there's a 40% decline in performance among the, the best students, okay? The average decline is over 20%. So the, the average decline in the classroom goes down by, the average uh, performance in the classroom goes down by over 20%, but among the best students, the top 25% of the students, those who are really at risk of showing up in the leaderboard. I mean, if you're a good student, you kind of know you're a good student. When you introduce leaderboard, uh, the performance of the students who are most at risk of showing up in the leaderboard goes down by more than 40%. Students don't do well. They don't like it. They don't want to show up in the leaderboard. We do a lot of things indicating, and I don't have time to talk about it here, uh, you know, indicating that students were making an active effort to avoid showing up in the leaderboard. I don't want to be seen there. It's, you know, it's not cool to be like, have the gold medal for the, the hard work and, you know, and, and performance. Of course, I came back to the company and showed them the data and said, hey guys, I don't think it's a good idea what you're doing. And they canceled the whole program and, and, start, you know, and, and switched to something else. Which, you know, I think it's, it highlights the importance of analyzing data. You know, a lot of pe companies now have a tremendous wealth of data and they're not using it and even scratching the surface. You know, it's nice to run experiments. You can learn a lot from experiments. But even without running experiments, you can analyze data and actually, you know, potentially revert the strategic decisions, which was the case here. The moment I saw this to them, I showed this to them, they said, okay, you got us. Now you can run your experiment. I'll give you some. So there was, it was, there was not just altruism on their part. They, 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 learned, they realized they could learn something from, from this. So yeah, you know, in some settings, actually publicly rewarding uh, achievement and effort can actually backfire. Uh, uh, and that's what we found here. Um, that's kind of the first, okay, so that is the first project I wanted to tell you guys about. So we learned that, you know, as I said, the goal here was to identify these peer pressure effects. And does, can, can these concerns about uh, judgment by others about fitting in, can these concerns actually affect important decisions? Well, it seems to be the case, okay? Now, the question is why? Why is it that students are avoiding some opportunities? You know, why, why, what are they trying to prove to others? What, what's the underlying reason? And that's what we're gonna study here in this second project. And it's not just of academic interest. Uh, you, know, it's, you know, it's nice, you can write a model, test some economic theory, and you know. But beyond that, I think it's very important for policy as, as I'm gonna argue later. Okay, this is based on another paper with uh, Georgi Egorov, who's a professor at Northwestern, and again, Robert Jensen uh, from Yale. Uh, uh, cool to be smart, so smart to be cool, understanding peer pressure in education. I'll describe why we have this, uh, this funny or, or not so funny title, um, you know, if you talk to many social scientists and you say, well, you know, I have a setting where there's negative peer pressure, kids are avoiding uh, effort in school, avoiding opportunities because they care about their peers and so on, people are going to say, well, yes, this is because kids are trying to, to be cool and it's super uncool to care about school and you know, invest in education, and work hard, do your homeworks, and so on. Uh, that's kind of, most people will have this prior on the reason behind these effects. And many times they will think, well, and that's probably uh, really relevant in low-income areas that have you know, messed up cultures and so on. That's how, how people would typically think of it, right? Uh, now, uh, we try to expand this idea and think, what could really lead to these negative effects of peer pressure? Is this just really a desire to be cool and show that you don't care about school? Or could there be something else going on? And we said, well, in fact, introspection leads us to think that, you know, there are certainly cultures in high schools where, in fact, what's really valued is not avoiding school, but rather what's really valued is academic success. Being smart, you know, it, in some settings, you know, there's, you know, people talk a lot about, you know, maybe there's a culture of achievement. People feel pressure to be smart or don't want their 
friends to think that they're not smart, that they're, they're, they're struggling and so on. Uh, we will study you know, how these two different types of stories can actually both lead to negative effects of peer pressure that look very similar. And I'm going to show you the idea of an experiment. It's going to be a little bit more complicated. Uh, but I'll show you the idea of an experiment that helps us identify uh, which of these two stories can explain some negative effects of peer pressure in different settings. And I'll argue that these different types of culture leading to similarly negative effects would imply very different policy prescriptions. And that's when we get to the policy discussion. So we run an experiment in one low-income school in LA and two high-income schools. Okay? Um, now, uh, so considering an education opportunity that generates two things, a private benefit, you benefit from it privately, but it also involves a cost, at least the time cost. Okay? Uh, um, you know, I think there could be many things. Even, you know, uh, raising your hand to answer a question in the classroom requires preparing, you know, studying the material in ahead of time, and you want to be ready for it. And then, you know, you answer, uh, raise your hand to answer a question, you get a private benefit. You get the feedback on whether you're right or wrong, the teacher might like you, realize that you're a good student, and so on, just this as an example. Now, let's think about the two mechanisms. The first mechanism is this culture that where it's smart to be cool. It's the, cool, the cu culture about being cool and, you know, not caring about education and so on, not being too cool for school. Now, in, in this simple economic model that we have here, uh, uh, when people see you studying a lot, the inference that they make about you is that, well, if Leo is studying so much, it must be that his opportunity cost of time is pretty low, right? If, if he's studying a lot, it's because he's not very good at doing other things. Because if he was very sm fun and, and cool, instead of being studying, he would be partying. So the fact that he's studying so much tells me something about how social and how cool he is. Because, you know, if you study a lot, you might signal that you're not great at partying, that you're not a fun person to be around. You don't have a lot of social value to your group, okay? So under this story, you know, the observability of a choice by your peers may lower the take up. Because being seen taking it up, this, taking this opportunity, for example, raise your hand in class, doing something that is observable, will signal something bad about how socially apt you are. Okay? So, you know, the teacher asks a question. He said, oh, if I raise my hand, everyone's going to look at me and say, here you go. He spent the night studying, prepping for this. This is a nerd and so on. So he's like, you know what? I'm not going to raise my hand. I'm going to stay quiet. I don't want to send this signal to my peers. Okay, that's one mechanism. Now comes the second mechanism culture that values being smart. It's a school where it's cool to be smart. Now, this is the one that is a little trickier, and, and I think it was the really surprising, uh, I think, the novel idea here, which is many times actions that you take in school also send a signal to your peers about how smart you are. Think about the same action. You raise, the teacher asks a question. You raise your hand. Okay, you raise your hand. Now you have to answer the question. Depending on what you say, people are going to think about things about you. Said you said something smart. Said, oh, well, Leo is actually he's pretty smart. You know, I didn't know that. Or you say something not so smart. They say, oof, that guy, huh? He's not. He's kind of stupid, huh? Not a very smart guy. You know. So many actions. You know, if you study, if you study hard and people know your grade, they're going to say, well, he's not that smart. Look at the grade he got, and so on. When grades are observable. So, so. Turns out that under this culture, you might actually also have an, a negative effect of, of observability, but for a very different reason, okay? Uh, um, suppose, you know, you're in a setting where you, you could, say, raise your hand and answer a question, but you, suppose you know you're not the smartest kid in the room, okay? And you would really benefit from answering, asking a question, right, or, or answering a question. But you might be afraid of doing it because you're afraid that by doing it, you might reveal something about your ability, about how smart you are. So you prefer to just avoid it all the way. Avoid some opportunity that could help you but also reveal something about how smart you are. And in fact, you might even pretend that you don't care, right? Instead of asking a question and revealing that I'm not so smart, I might actually disrupt the class and say, you know what, I don't care about this. I have other things to do. So people are going to say, instead of thinking that I'm 
that I'm stupid, they're going to think that, oh, Liu is just this, you know, crazy guy who likes to party and so on. You, you end up signaling something completely different to your classmates, okay? Uh, so that's really a very different mechanism that could actually lead kids to avoid opportunities, but for a very different reason, okay? Now, we designed an experiment to see if you, in different types of schools, you have different mechanisms operating, and we'll show that. And also, I'm going to conclude by saying, well, if you're in a school where the culture is smart to be cool, the type of policy you have to design to, to, uh, to you know, simulate education is very different from the type of policy that you would design here. In fact, the policy is sometimes the type of policy that will help you here, will actually hurt you here as a policymaker. So it's very important. You might be creating a bigger problem by going for the solution to this problem if you happen to be in this setting. So it's important not only to understand to show the existence of a problem, but it's also important to understand what's driving it when you're thinking about policy. Okay, so actually this might be the trickier slide, okay? Those are the two, this is like uh, the, the tricky pair, okay? Uh, let's motivate this one, because this is a co more complicated experiment because, you know, in economics, when you we're thinking about it, it, designing experiments, showing that something exists is many times challenging but showing why it exists even more challenging. It's, you know, it's, it, it, it has by definition to be something subtler, right? Because now we're trying to get at the, the mechanics of something. So this one is a little bit trickier. So think about the following. Think about an, an opportunity that, is, that, that the student might undertake. Uh, say, raise your hand, the, the same one, raise your hand to answer your question. And there's a probability P, okay? There's a probability that you're gonna receive both the benefit and it will also review information about the economic type. So you raise your hand, there's a probability P that the, the teacher calls you, and then you answer your question, you get the benefit, you get the feedback from answering, you learn something, but you will review something about your type, depending on your answer, about how smart you are. Okay, that's why I, what I call the economic type. If you are in a culture where it's smart to be cool, having a higher probability of being called by the students would actually make, by the teacher, would actually make the student more likely to raise their hand. Why is that? Well, think about it. If the culture is about being cool, the moment you raise your hand, you're cooked. People already know you're, you're the nerd. You know, oh, look at him. He studied again. He's raising your hands, trying to please the teacher. Uh, then you already paid your cost, your social cost, by raising your hand. So the moment you do it, you kind of hope that at least you get called because at least you're going to get some, something out of it, right? You learn whether you're right and so on. So a higher P will make you more likely to to be willing to pay the social cost of revealing that you're a nerd that you study. Okay? Now think about the other case. Okay? Uh, suppose you're in a setting where the fear is to appear as not being smart. Okay? And suppose you're that student who knows you know, you're not that smart compared you see all everyone being. So you raise your hand. Okay? The moment you raise your hand, that's good. You say, oh, I know Leo, he kind of knows what he's doing. I didn't know that, he raised his hand, probably he's smart, he, he caught up and so on. But you raise your hand, but you really don't want this, the teacher to call you. Because the moment that the teacher calls you, you're gonna reveal that you're trying to pretend to be a smart guy by raising your hand, right? So it's the, this case where you wanna raise your hand to, to signal that you're smart, that you're on top of the game, but you kinda hope you don't get called, right? That's a kind of an extreme case, because if you get called, you still get the private benefit but you're trading this off against a social cost, potentially, of revealing that you're not so smart. If you care enough about this social stigma, you might be in a case where you want to pretend you want to do something, but you really hope you don't get it, if, if it's observable. So a higher probability might actually reduce the take up of this action in public. So that's kind of how we designed the experiment. Said, okay, let's think of an action and vary the probability that people get it and that it's observable both the action and, and the outcome, okay? And, and the idea is that we might find different effects of varying this probability. That's kind of the idea of the experiment. So basically, we did a very similar experiment uh, with a very, basically the same idea of coming to the schools and offering an SAT prep package and so on. Uh, but here, it's a slightly different package. They both get the SAT prep course, but if they sign up and get it, uh, they have to take a diagnostic test score who predicts how well you would do in the SAT if you took it. It's a pretty good measure of how smart you are, right? 
So if you say yes to it, you have to take this diagnostic test score because this program is, is kind of tailored around your needs, your strengths and weaknesses. So they really have to take it. So the idea was uh, uh, randomize uh, the probability of winning the package condition on signing up during the experiment. That's the P that I described. Think about the same idea. I sign up, there's a chance that I get it, and I randomize, it is a 25% chance or 75% chance. Probability that you get called, right? And whether the students, another thing we've randomized, is whether students believe that the other students in the room would observe their decision to sign up and their diagnostic test score if they got it. Okay, so I, I, I vary uh, both, you know, your expectation that they're gonna observe your action and your grade, if you, if you did it, how you score, okay? So in practice, the wording was, if you choose to sign up, your name will be entered into a lottery where you have 25 or 70% chance of winning the package. That's the first randomization we did, just one digit. Both your decision to sign up and your diagnostic test score will be kept completely private from everyone, including or except the other students in the room. We decided to double down. It worked the first time, so let's do it again, including or except. So it's a very subtle experiment. The most that we varied across kids was one digit and one word. So it's a very subtle experiment. And here's what we found. The first thing we found, so here I'm pulling kids, uh, pulling the two probabilities. Regardless of the high or low probability of getting this, uh, I'm looking at the low-income school and the high-income school, okay? This is a sign-up in private, and this is a sign-up in public. The f and this picture, is, I think, is really striking because you look at it and you say, well, first, in private, 80% of the kids say yes to it. 53% of them say yes to it in public, in the low-income school. When you go to the high-income schools, what do, you, what do you get? Very similar numbers, essentially identical. So if I had to stop the experiment here, a lot of people would say, hmm, look at this. We have the same problem going on in low-income and high-income schools. And if your prior, like many people's prior, is that this is driven by a culture of being cool and avoiding education, you say, wow, great, we just learned in high-income schools, kids are also trying to avoid achievement. That's people's priors about the, the, the story. Okay, good, so let's design policies and up generalize and apply them here. So if you top, stop the experiment here, you might be led to the wrong conclusions. That's why I think it's important to try to understand the mechanisms, understand what's driving a, a given phenomenon, because that might lead to very different policy implications. So luckily, we didn't stop to take the experiment here. We went step further and decided to do the mechanisms part. And here, this is the low-income school, and this is the variation whether there's a 75% chance they're gonna get the package and have the score, scores revealed if they get it, or 25%, private and public. What we find is that in public, in private doesn't matter, you know, if you're gonna get the lottery or not, a higher chance of getting the package or not doesn't matter because, you know, uh, no one's gonna observe it, so th these mechanisms should, be, should not be operating. But here, we, this is what happened in public. Remember, this is a setting, the low-income school, we, we started from the assumption, where kids care about showing that they're cool, that they're social. And as I described, uh, in this setting, uh, if you, you pay the cost, the stigma cost, the social, social cost, the moment you, people know that you wanted something, the moment you raise your hand and say, okay, it's a nerd. So you kind of want to get the benefit because you already revealed that you're a nerd. So not surprisingly, the take up when the chance of getting the package is higher is really relatively high, 62%. When the chance of getting the package is lower, 25%, very few kids do it. It's like, you know, well, I'm just exposing myself as a nerd for no reason because the only 25% chance I'm going to get this package. I'm not going to do it. So kids seem to understand that and they're less likely to do it. Now comes the high income schools. Remember, our prediction is that here the effect of the higher lot probability should flip. And this is what we find. And that is very surprising. What we find here is that, again, in private, it doesn't matter, but in public, more kids are willing to sign up when the chance of getting the package is lower. Okay. In a non behavior model, that would make no sense. It's like, there's a higher chance you're going to get this and still you're less likely to want it, but it's only happening public because that's our story. Our story is that if, you know, there are a number of kids who would like their, their classmates to think that they're this academically oriented kid, really uh, driven, ambitious, want to study for, the co for college entrance, 
And so they're going to do it here. But the moment you increase the chance that you get it, but also reveal your score to your classmates, a bunch of kids run away from the, the and I think for me this is a very surprising finding. Uh, uh, to provide further evidence, we find that those kids running away from the package, our prediction is that w which kids would run away? Those who have low grades. We kind of know they're not the, the best kid, the smartest kid in the world, right? The kids who are really smart, do, does really well, I said, I don't care. Great. If people are going to find out, the better. So we split by uh, the students here by whether uh, uh, they have grades above or below the median. And what we see is that the kids who are really running away from the package when there's a higher chance of getting it and revealing the scores are those with low grades, which makes sense. If I, I know my grades are not so high, you're giving me an opportunity, something that could really help me. But that comes with a catch, that if I take it, my score is going to be revealed to my classmates. So even if I have a higher chance of getting it, just because there's a higher chance as well that my score is going to be revealed to my classmates, I'm going to run away from it. It goes from 57% to 22%. Okay? For those with better grades, you see a much smaller decrease. Okay? That's how I think we start, build, we start really believing in the story we have here. So that's kind of, kind of what we did. We also collected uh, some other things, uh, some survey data, asking them directly about uh, what they think makes kids popular in their, popular in their school. And it really lines up. In the schools, in the classrooms where we see strong effects of this norm of trying to be cool, kids were saying it. Yes, what makes kids popular is actually being social, not working hard, and so on. In the, in the classrooms where we find these big effects of this norm of, of avoiding revealing that you're not smart, people say, yeah, the popular kids in my school are those who are those really smart, who do really well. So it really lines up with those survey questions. Okay, so that's kind of the second experiment. I said it's a little trickier, but I think it's important when you think about policy, and we, which is what we're going to be discussing now just in the last couple of slides, a policy discussion. Uh, we find, you know, in these advantage areas in the first experiment, these peer, large and powerful peer effects, peer pressure effects, which, as we said, interestingly, it can go in both directions, right? It could have a positive effect or negative effect, even in the same school. You know, depending on whether, remember the first paper, sitting in honors class and on non-honors classes, which is kind of crazy because there are many kids who many times we're not thinking, oh, let's put these kids in this setting or that kid in that setting. That could have very important consequences that might completely shape the type of decision they undertake. Uh, you know, large increases in take off when more privacy is assured in non-honors classes. This has implications for understanding disadvantage and how assistance or help should be offered in schools. Now, I think it's interesting because, as we said, it's pretty hard to change who your peers are. It's not always the case, but changing how observable things are is easier, right? Uh, you know, so thinking about observability of actions becomes something important. If there's stigma associated with some actions, you might want to make them private, okay? And some other things that we take for granted, we think, oh, this is great, this is going to you know, motivate students like giving them awards or other forms of recognition, public recognition. Well, it's not always the case. I remember, we had that leaderboard, it completely backfired. So really thinking about, you know, well, there are cultures in which, you know, these things are actually discouraged or sanctioned. So you might want to think about it. Now, Going beyond that, I think that we get to this uh, finding that there could be negative effects of peer pressure also in higher income schools, but for a very different motive, right? Uh, a lot of people might have, the, 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 have had the prior that, you know, oh, you know, the reason why kids avoid, you know, opportunities in, around their peers is because they want to signal that they're cool, that they don't care about school. So now you're showing me this in high income schools. What I learned from it is that, well, maybe this norm, this culture exists everywhere. Uh, well, it turns out that that's not why it's happening in the high income schools. It's very important to understand the mechanism because, well, if there are different explanations, uh, the policy recommendations are actually different as well, as I'm going to discuss in the next slide. Okay? And reassuringly, uh, there are easy ways to identify the existing culture. Even you know, beyond the complicated experiment, just by asking kids, what makes a popular kid in your school can actually help you identify the type of culture. And that, that's, let me be a little bit more precise in my last slide. 
what do I mean about the importance of thinking about these mechanisms in understanding policy? You know, I'll give you a lot of concrete examples. I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to, those are things that many times people think about. Should grades be private or public? Uh, efforts, opportunities to exert effort and study. Should they, how pr much privacy should you give to students? Uh, should you provide incentives for studying? Uh, should you force participation in school, in class, cold calling and so on? Should we introduce tracking? Uh, how should you design information and marketing campaigns? How should we label things? As I'll discuss, depending on the type of problem, type of culture that exists, the answer is going to be very different, okay? Let me give you a, a very simple example. Um, if kids are worried about revealing that they're low ability, you should not make grades public because some kids are going to be very embarrassed, okay? Uh, so you, that's a clear recommendation uh, for uh, cultures, for schools where the culture is about achievement. Now, if, if kids are worried about you know, a stigma associated with trying hard, then what needs to be private is not the grades, but rather the input or the efforts. You need to provide opportunities for kids to study without other people realizing how much they're studying, okay? Because then that's, they're going to avoid opportunities because, you know, if there's extra classes that are public and everyone sees you, you're going to avoid it, okay? Whereas in the other culture, it's actually good. You're gonna, you want others to think that you care about it, that you study. So it's very different. For example, participation mandates. If you're in a culture, the culture is about being cool, then participation mandates a good idea because if the stigma is about raising your hand and revealing that you're a nerd, if you force answers, if you cold call, then you remove the stigma. It's like, I had no choice. The teacher asked me a question, I'm just answering. I didn't study, I'm just, you know, I just know this thing, I didn't study. So it's good, you remove the stigma associated with the action. Now suppose you have a culture where people are trying to avoid the stigma of not being the smartest then it's terrible. If you're the kid, you know you're not that smart. If there's forced participation, then you're gonna be, you're gonna be so scared. You know, it's embarrassing. Just attending class is gonna be a painful experience because you know the teacher might cold call you. Uh, in the limit, you might even stop showing up in class. So you see, it has very different implications. Uh, even like things about how information or like labeling, for example. Uh, you introduce uh, after hours, after school program. If you are in a setting where uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, the norm is about being smart, then you want to label. You don't want to label it as like assistance because everyone's going to be embarrassed that you need assistance or extra help or so on. You want to label it as, as achievement, advancement, success, and things of the sort. And then kids are going to associate it with something that is good. But if you do this in a school where the norm is about being cool and not studying, no one's going to do it because they're going to say, look at him, that, the kid is really trying hard, huh? So you want to label it in a different way, okay? So I see the same thing can have very different implications. In fact, it's even trickier than that. Uh, you know, in, in schools where kids are, have an uh, anti-achievement culture, you might want to try to frame things as about, about, well, school is important, right? It, you know, it's cool, it's actually, you know, it's not a bad thing. And so you want to instill this idea on people uh, to actually get them to, 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 to be more motivated. The problem, though, is that you push this too hard, you might create the other culture. So that's, a, that's, that's a kind of a, a tricky thing. On the other hand, if you're in a culture where kids are already worried about, you know, you know failing and so on, maybe you want to have a different type of information campaign. It's going to say, well, it's okay to fail at first. Important people actually had a hard beginning sometimes, you know, just to say, you know, you can fail at first, it doesn't mean you're not going to be big or uh, important later on. So you can see how even things like information campaigns and labeling really depend on the type of mechanism behind these this peer pressure problems, okay? Without an understanding of the mechanism, you would not have, you know, thought about, you know, a adapting the type of policy to the type of culture. So it's important to learn, one, culture, Peer pressure can actually really affect important decisions in school, and that's something that people typically ignore, ignore in rational standard economic models. They're really thinking about a student in isolation making an intertemporal calculation, depending on how my returns are going to be, should I do this or not? How this is going to affect my salary and so on? Well, it turns out that there are other things that are happening right now that sometimes are very important in kids' minds. How are they going to be judged by their peers? You know, are they going to 
appreciate it, I'm gonna disapprove it, those things seem to matter to a large extent. So that's first lesson. Okay, peer pressure matters and can actually negatively affect important decisions. Second, well, it's important to understand the mechanisms because sometimes very similar effects can be explained by very different reasons. And if you don't have a solid understanding of that, you're not gonna be able to formulate the appropriate policy to deal with the problem. And as you see, it's an important problem. So I'd like to finish here. Thank you.